I'm Lucy Brito. I'm with Cleveland School Remembers in Stockton, California. I joined after the El Paso shooting of August 3rd, 2019. It was heart-wrenching to watch on TV someone we knew, Police Chief Greg Allen of El Paso, Texas, describe the tragedy. The anti-immigrant theme in the shooter's manifesto was alarming. Since CSR was already engaged in the movement, I joined wanting to help reduce gun violence. For too long, I was naive and a bit selfish about gun violence. It wasn't until my own family was directly impacted that I educated myself about this uniquely American problem. For the past 21 years, since my son was injured in a hate-motivated attack at a Jewish community center, I've been a Brady activist with the San Fernando Valley chapter, using my passion as a parent and experience as a public health professional to make communities safer for all Americans. We have a right to live in peace without the fear of gun violence. Hello, my name is RJ Harrison, and I'm the brother of Rashad Williams. And the reason why I'm giving you this video is because I lost my brother to gun violence, and it's other people around the world that have lost their loved ones to gun violence. And I just wanted to stop. Enough is enough. Thank you, Lou and RJ and Lauren for sharing your stories and for everyone who shared their stories this week. Um, it's been a really powerful week. I know yesterday was it was really emotional, but it was inspiring. And today we have a very full um, hour. I'm gonna try and keep it tight and would keep things moving along so that we end at four o'clock. We have a closed session. You have to have registered for it. So if you didn't get the, uh, be sure to check your email because Chica sent an email to everybody who's been invited to the closed session. So be sure to respond to it so you can attend the closed session. My name is Suzanne Verge. I've been doing this work for 20 years. I'm one of the original Million Mom Marchers with my friend Donna and several people here. I have been doing this work in memory of my brother Peter who was murdered here in Santa Monica at age 18. I will be keeping an eye on the Q&A box. I will also keep an eye on the chat. I just want you to know if for some reason you don't get your question answered or if we run out of time, we will make sure you have people's email addresses so that you can email them afterwards and get your questions answered, okay? I want the presenters to have as much time as possible and you will get your questions answered and we will end at four o'clock. Um, our first panel is gonna be the school and parent notification and it's gonna be done by Margot Bennett and Donald Finkelstein. Margot Bennett and has been the executive director of Women Against Gun Violence for over 11 years. She is an incredible partner, an incredible force. I'm gonna let her introduce herself. And I also wanna introduce Donna Finkelstein, one of the original Million Mom March members, 20 year activist, board member at Women Against Gun Violence, recently honored with a leadership award. She's active with the San Fernando Valley chapter. She is tenacious. She's the one that she and Margo responsible for getting the school memo done Took her 10 years, but she never stopped. Turn it over to you, Margo and Donna. You're mute. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Suzanne. I'm Margo Bennett, the Executive Director of Women Against Gun Violence, and I'm so honored that you invited me to talk with you today about safe gun storage and getting that information home to households with children. But first I'd like to give you a little history. Uh, safe gun storage has been 
a primary focus of Women Against Gun Violence since we were founded in 1993. One of our initial programs was called Keeping Them Safe, and we worked with parents and caregivers on safe gun storage, and we taught them how to have the important conversation with their family, friends, neighbors, and children, the conversations that will help keep their children and our community safe. Over the, the years, these trainings took place in PTA meetings, um, at after school programs, and the LA City Attorney would frequently invite us to speak at schools as part of the Safe School Initiative. In 2013, we rebranded our Keeping Them Safe program, and now it's called the Talk Project. Here are our materials. We have two types of materials, and they come in four different languages. Um, so the name of the program changed, but its purpose didn't. Its purpose of keeping them safe and the talk project is to get safe gun storage information into the hands of households with children. Our, um, so our purpose is the same. Our distribution vehicles are the same. And those distribution vehicles of the information are schools and health clinics. Queens Care Health uh, Centers has been a generous advocate for us, a great partner and a great funder of getting this information out. Also what hasn't changed is our successful protocol. Um, the protocol we use to secure buy-in and um, what makes it successful, I believe, is that we start at the top. So we've kept that consistent. So here are a few historical examples of how that worked. And by the way, it continues to work in Los Angeles County School Districts. In 2013, we received significant funding to have our talk project brochures printed and distributed to families in Los Angeles County. We decided to focus on school districts as our primary distribution vehicle, and we were immediately successful. We emailed school boards of the school districts in LA County. We sent them our materials via digitally via email, and we got amazing response. We didn't even have to attend a meeting. It was all just by email, but it was by email to the decision-making organization. Um, so that's all it took. We brought in Long Beach Unified, Glendale, Santa Monica Malibu, Pasadena, Burbank. All of them got on board. We were able to package our brochures, deliver them to elementary schools, which were our focus. Um, and get them out to households with children. The flaw in our ask of the school boards was that we just asked them to authorize the distribution. We didn't ask them to mandate. And one of the things we learned was that when principals had the discretion as to whether the materials went home, some, a very few, but still some decided not to send our materials home. Over the last few years, we've changed our ask of the school boards. Now what we ask is for them to pass a resolution making it a requirement that safe gun storage information goes home. And we also have asked them uh, to make sure that they get an acknowledgement of receipt. So that's how our ask changed, but once again, our protocol remained the same. So now I want to just talk very briefly about the protocol. It may seem simplistic because it's probably the way most of us are, live our lives when we address issues that we're facing, but we've consistently found that the way to be successful is to go to the top. It works. You don't need to speak to individual principals, school counselors, teachers, parents, parent-teacher groups at this stage of the process. Just go to the top. 
um, before COVID, what we would do initially is attend a school board meeting. Now, I guess you would have to attend online. And we would speak during the public comment section because safe storage wasn't yet on the agenda. So we would speak during the public comments period. We talk about the importance of safe gun storage, how it relates to school shootings, suicides, unintentional shootings, um, and the important role that school boards can play to get information home on safe gun storage and the legal requirements. And this is the way we feel it's very important to frame it. We're getting home the legal requirements associated with safe gun storage. It's not a political issue. Families, caretakers, people with guns need to know what they need to do to stay within the confines of the law. We would then ask them at that meeting during public comment to please agendize our request to have safe gun storage information sent home. Um, and we did this in front of the public, in a public meeting, in front of their peers. No one-on-one -on -one private asks. Everybody needs to know that they've been asked because it becomes more difficult for them to say no to such a common sense request. Um, they may actually turn to their clerk at the meeting which has happened and said, Jen buys the item for the next meeting or you know, two meetings, or they may refer you to their website, which will have the procedures. And I just want to say, follow the directions. Just follow the directions and then monitor your request. Check the upcoming agendas. Has it been put on the agenda? If it hasn't, call the school board administrative staff. Um, don't go to a non-decision-making person or entity for assistance. Always go back to the school board, go back to their staff, unless they direct you to do something else. Once you're on the agenda, now it's time to build su um, support. And that's when you start going to the asso your associates, the PTA, your friends, family, um, parent associations, that's when you get buy-in from the community. And then when the item is put on the agenda, those are the people you bring with you to speak in support of the resolution. Also during the time that you're building support, oh, my dog has something to say about safe gun storage. Um, so one of the things that you're doing during the same period is that you're sending the school board members copies of resolutions that have passed elsewhere, a one pager of information that they can adapt or use as is to be the document that they send home to parents. Um, the idea is to do as much of the work for them, do as much of the research for them so that it becomes easier. So then show up to the meeting, bring all of the supporters, with you, speak on behalf of the resolution, and then, um, you know, hopefully it will pass. This is the exact protocol we use, for example, with Culver City School District. And using this protocol, it took us two months to get the resolution passed. And that is two, count, um, two school board meetings, one of which was the one where I spoke in open comment. So not even one where they were reviewing the resolution, but with all, but just, so just two months got it done. And here's why I think the protocol works. You're focusing on the decision makers and that's, that's really important. You're addressing them jointly and in public. I'm never somebody who minimizes the embarrassment factor. I think it can play a really big role in getting common sense things done. You're not wasting their time and your time. And I think that's really important. And um, one of the drawbacks to addressing your personal connections rather than the decision-making entity is if one of your personal contacts says no, 
then for you to continue to proceed, you've, you've alienated someone that you may not want to alienate. So, you know, once again, go to the top and work with them. Uh, I just want to say that um, I know that Brady has distributed on, um, I think on chat, a Google Doc that has all of the documents that we've used. Um, but I want to tell you that you can email me as well. I'll be happy to email them to you digitally. It's our one page protocol. Um, one pager that we provide to schools, our school board resolutions that have passed, just a sampling of them, um, sample speeches that some of us have made before the school boards, and then uh, a mass mailing that we did to all the private schools and the charter schools um, to get them to send safe gun storage home. Um, so, that's it on our protocol. And once again, just thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you. Do you want to go ahead, Donna? Hi, uh, good afternoon. I am Donna Finkelstein, a 20 year member of Brady United and an eight year board member of Women Against Gun Violence. I'm a mom, a grandmother, and professionally a high school counselor. Thank you for inviting me here today to share my story about convincing our school district to send home safe gun storage information to parents. My activism began in 1999 after my daughter survived being shot, so I know the pain as a parent of gun violence. As a Brady member and gun violence activist, I participated in tabling, lobbying, marching, calling legislators, presenting information to parent groups, et cetera. A few years later, it was clear to me we needed to reach a larger audience of parents, so why not start at the top? The superintendent of Los Angeles Unified School District, the second largest school district in this country, 600,000 students. My approach began in 2008, after many unanswered calls, doors closed, presentations to administrators and counselors, the ball got rolling slowly. In 2012, when I joined Women Against Gun Violence, I used the talk project in our communities and local school districts other than LAUSD and was very well received. We also wrote a one pager for safe gun storage that was placed on LAUSD's website, but we needed to do more. Soon after the Parkland shooting, our city attorney, Mike Fuhr, established a blue ribbon panel to focus on school safety. Even though I was not invited to sit on the panel, I attended and spoke about our talk project and safe gun storage. And at those meetings, our school superintendent was there. This is when I was invited to meet and collaborate with her to create a plan for parent notification. Around the same time, I also approached my local school board member, who I knew professionally and personally. He listened and set up follow-up meetings with me. Next step, the city attorney and board member who I was working with were at a news conference and joining together in a plan to send home to parents whose child attends an LAUSD school to receive safe gun storage information with a sign off. Woohoo! So in June of 2019, the Los Angeles Unified School District board members passed a resolution and they titled it Safe Gun Storage, Safe Lives, to notify every parent about safe gun storage and suicide. Since that passage, over five other school districts have passed a similar resolution. Last January, I testified in Sacramento before the Education Committee of the Assembly on behalf of AB 276, which would require all California public and charter schools to send home safe gun storage information to all parents. Sadly, the bill has been pulled for now. Margot just presented from WAGVA the protocol, which I recommend you use now as it is more efficient and effective rather than the personal route that I used all those years ago. These, there are hundreds of California schools districts to educate, so go for it. We must educate our parents 
first to protect our children from unsecured guns in the home and suicide. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Margo. I noticed that they placed in the chat the link to the documents and someone asked for Margo's uh, email address. I also sent that off in the chat. And we do have a question. Margo, maybe you could take this one. Uh, it says, somehow gun safety seems to be a political issue for some school district leaders. Have you had to overcome that even in a public meeting setting? Yes. <laughs> and really, one of the things I stress is that it's just notifying households of the laws. And just like um, they use their notification system to notify families and caregivers of other legal requirements in the state, this is, this is no different. Um, it's helpful when California passes new um, child access prevention laws, because then you can say, you know, this is a new law, it's really important, parents uh, know. And so um, in one instance, I had the benefit of that. But I think, um, you know, we're not talking about having guns at home, we're talking about storing them. And I just think you need to uh, just stress that to them. They're educators, they should be able to tell the difference. Thank you, Margo. And thank you, Donna. I, Margo, I'll never forget that night in Culver City. And I, I really, it was a great night and I've seen you in action. Uh, <laughs> I hope the group gets to know Margo. Uh, Women Against Gun Violence has been around for over 30 years and they are a great partner. And so I hope you'll reach out to them if you have any questions that were not answered. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next topic, ghost guns. And our next topic is by our Steve Lindley, the guru of ghost guns. Um, Brady chapter leaders heard about Steve. We heard his name easily for 10 years and before we finally even met the legend, but Amanda would always talk about you, Steve. And Steve is the program manager here in Los Angeles for Brady. He's a 27 year law enforcement veteran. Steve served as the chief of the Bureau of Firearms here in California for more than eight years. He has testified in over 80 firearm related legislative hearings, collaborated on 100 firearm related bills. And I think this is amazing, Steve. You assisted in the authoring and implementation of the California Landmark Ammunition Background Check Initiative. When, yes, and when Amanda said, guess who's coming to work at Brady? We heard Steve Lindley. When, when I say we were elated, that is an understatement. Steve, we are so grateful that you're on our team and we can't wait to hear um, about ghost guns, especially after yesterday when Brian shared his story about his daughter, Gracie. Take it away, Steve. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm blushing again, as usual, uh, but it's also an honor to be part of such a um, well thought of and hardworking organization that's truly trying to make change in all of our communities. So I get the uh, honor to talk uh, today about ghost guns, which is a emerging uh, issue here, not only in California, but throughout the nation. And you know, I've talked about this several times uh, with a number of our um, different organizations, but you know, I want to get through it a little bit more today, especially in light of some of the um, other presentations that took place this week. Uh, this week. So just briefly, you know, ghost guns, what are they and, and why should we care? And that's one of the main concerns. So essentially a ghost gun is a receiver or a firearm that is in 80% of its operational capacity. So under the uh, ATF's rules, if it's under 80% put together, it does not require a serial number because it is not a firearm. So this trend started here in California to get around some of our landmark assault weapon registrations where individuals were using these 80% uh, lower receivers to construct untraceable, undocumented assault weapons, mainly the AR-15s. However, over time, that has changed away from assault weapons and long guns towards handguns. 
And the biggest thing about these, uh, what you're going to hear is because they don't have a serial number on them, they go around all of California's background check processes and all the other firearm laws that we put into place over the last 30 years. So that's why it is a big issue for us to address. So um, as we know that background checks do save lives, not only here in California, but nationally we've seen how the Brady background uh, check system has uh, prohibited a number of people, not only here in California, but nationally from possessing firearms. And that number is in the millions, not just in the you know, hundreds or the thousands, but the millions of people over the last uh, 25 plus years that have been barred from possessing firearms because of um, various issues. With a ghost gun, this circumvents all those laws, both here in California and nationally. So I wanna kind of go over real quick uh, what they look like because you know a picture just say uh, is, is worth a thousand words. So over here on the, uh, at least on, on my left hand side, is from the Del Mar Gun Show in December of 2019, one of the, the last gun shows that was allowed to take place here in California. And you can see this is an AR-15 lower receiver. It is a, a ghost gun uh, part, it is not completed. And it's on sale for $120. $120 for an untraceable firearm. Uh, the middle picture is that same um, receiver. And this area right here is the magazine well. And this is where the trigger assembly would go on a normal uh, lower receiver. And this is the piece that needs to be milled out. What's not uh, on the photograph is there are uh, perforations here on the outside in order to uh, help the individual who is going to be tooling this to actually tool it properly. And there's also other devices to help uh, in order to make sure that they're properly um, uh, milled out. So on the right hand side here is just a number of, of various types of lower receivers and these are all for the AR type firearms. Again, uh, anywhere between uh, 120 on the high end to some of these are a lot cheaper because they're made out of polymer plastic. So, uh, you know, why, why is there a bigger problem here in California compared to the AR-15 style ghost guns to the handguns? Um, basic numbers. We're, we're taking uh, ATF's 2016 tracing report for California, and they're listing uh, about 8,200 firearms, or I'm sorry, rifles, recovered here in California at crime scenes. And of those 8,000 rifles, only a small, small percentage are actually assault weapons. When you look at how many handguns are recovered, there was over uh, 22,000 handguns recovered in, in California for that same year. So you see uh, almost a uh, three time larger issue when it comes to handguns compared to rifles, and uh, then assault weapons make a small portion of that. Now, assault weapons are used more often in mass shootings, but in day-to-day -day crimes, uh, they're a little rare. Okay, so moving forward to the um, Orange County and then the Ventura Gun Show. Uh, here on the left-hand side are, is a, it's basically a Glock 17 clone pistol. And they're being shown here disassembled at the Orange County Gun Show. Just a month later, you see that they're partially assembled. You have, uh, you have the lower receiver, you have the slide, and they're put together for marketing purposes or display purposes with rubber bands and with a, a zip tie. Within, that little uh, display and what's in the box is everything that you need in order to put together a pistol. Should take you, you know, maybe about 20 minutes uh, or, or so to do it. Um, there's ways to do it more professionally or do it very crudely, but either way, you can put together this gun in about 20 minutes. This is considered uh, a, a ghost gun. It had no serial number. And when I, I purchased one of these uh, guns, and I will call it a gun, not just a, a ghost gun. You know, they wanted quick turnaround. They didn't want to discuss uh, how to put it together. They didn't want to discuss any paperwork that you might want to uh, notify DOJ if you do put it together. They wouldn't even provide a receipt, cash and carry, for $400. If you bought that same pistol, uh, the Glock pistol from a regular gun dealer, it'd be about $650. So not only can you uh, get them without a background check, you can get them cheaper than a regular handgun. So uh, the expanding problem here in California, I want to kind of go over some of the, the details of what these ghost guns do here in California specifically. So ability to purchase over the internet. 
So uh, a lot of you have worked hard uh, for two decades to make sure that in California, that all firearm transactions are done through a licensed and regulated firearm dealer, and they have to be done in person. With ghost guns, that does away with that uh, mandate. No background checks whatsoever. So with that, we, we can't keep these out of the hands of prohibited individuals. They're not traceable by law enforcement, and they're easily accessible uh, by anybody who is otherwise prohibited. Um, we also have here in California one firearm per month. There's no such requirement here with those guns because you know, we don't know what's being sold. So again, a, a big giant loophole. No firearm safety certificates. So with that, at least here in California, we have the, the mandate that you have to have some basic firearm knowledge and firearm safety uh, before you can actually purchase firearm. Uh, no, no requirement here with the ghost gun. Again, under federal law, it's not considered a firearm. And on top of that, we also have no age restrictions. Um, so with that, uh, anybody that can have a credit card or cash can get one of these, whether it's in person or via the internet. And the fire, and finally, no safety uh, firearm testing. Here in California, we've had a number of, of testing requirements that a lot of you have worked very hard on uh, uh, over the uh, last 20 years to put into place. So we have no chamber load indicator, no magazine safety release, and no micro stamping requirement uh, on these. So again, some of the biggest laws that we worked very hard on here in California, this does a giant uh, end around of all those. So. Is the problem growing? Yes, and here's some statistics from agencies that actually somewhat track them and are willing to uh, put out that information. ATF, which has two offices here in California, reported that in 2019, 30% of all the firearms that they recovered here in California are listed or considered ghost guns. Now, they wouldn't give the exact number of firearms that they collect, but just working with them uh, over you know, 15 years, they collect a massive amount of firearms here in California. So for them to say that 30% of them are ghost guns is a very scary, very scary uh, statistic. The Los Angeles Police Department. And this statistic uh, will probably be changed. We're working with LAPD to kind of really uh, identify what is a ghost gun and what might be uh, another type of a firearm that might be uh, mis, uh, uh, described as a firearm. But uh, they recently said that in 2019, 40% of the firearms that they recovered or ghost guns. Again, LAPD recovers about you know eight to 10,000 firearms per year. And they're uh, stating about 40% of them in 2019 were ghost guns. Again, it's a large number. So what has California done? And this is what I think is most important for us and what we need to do in the future. Assembly Bill 1673, back in 2016, uh, ran by Assembly Member uh, Gibson from Los Angeles. Uh, went both through the assembly and through the Senate, it was passed, but unfortunately, Governor Brown, Governor Brown vetoed it. Um, and this really would have stopped our ghost gun problem before it really became an issue. But Governor Brown at the time didn't see this as a uh, public safety uh, issue here in California, so we vetoed it. It was also a year there was a number of other uh, firearm bills that went forward. And as we know, Governor Brown, he was about 50-50 on, the, on uh, the firearm bills, and this is one of the ones that fell victim to his veto pen. So, um, with the new governor uh, in place, again, Assemblymember Gibson ran uh, Assembly Bill 879 in 2019. Now, that was a very watered down version of the original bill, and it didn't outright ban ghost guns. But what it did is the precursor parts, the things that you attach to these um, um, ghost guns, needed to be regulated. And they're going to go through the same background check process uh, as the ammunition and requires that um, if you decide to purchase one of these ghost guns, build it up into a firearm that within a certain amount of time, you have to apply for a serial number and a background check with Cal DOJ. But again, that's on the back end and that's uh, on the honor system. And we, we kind of see what this industry and uh, some of its customers do with the honor system. So, uh, you know, we, California took some steps, but you see some other states who don't even have nearly the problem that California has with this, taking far more aggressive uh, stances. So December 2019, the uh, Pennsylvania Attorney General classified ghost guns as, fi as firearms, which is essentially what um, a Gibson's original bill would have done. And they just said in Pennsylvania, you know what, we don't have ghost guns, they're firearms. And with that, they needed to be serialized and um, um, go through the background check process. So in essence, they've solved their problem in Pennsylvania. So some other states or you know, cities, Washington, D.C., in, in March of this year, 
um, they signed an emergency legislation banning kits altogether in, uh, in, in the city. So again, very similar to what Pennsylvania did, they're saying you just can't have these untraceable ghost gun kits. You can't sell them, you can't possess them uh, in, the, in, in Washington, D.C. Again, you know, solving the problem. Rhode Island, of all places, uh, again, in June of this year. So uh, some people will say, well, California had to deal with the, the, the pandemic issue. Well, some of these other locations were dealing with the pandemic as well, but they still uh, saw this as a public safety impact. So uh, they, took, uh, they took steps to um, mitigate. It. Again, signing a, signing a bill, uh, redefining what a ghost guns are, and then making them illegal to manufacture, import, sell, ship, deliver, possess inside um, Rhode Island. They also went further dealing with the 3D printed uh, gun issue, which will probably be our, our next issue. So again, you see in state after state, city after city dealing uh, with this issue where California really hasn't, and we have the biggest problem, and it started here initially. So finally, Washington, D.C., um, you know, the Attorney General there decided to sue the manufacturer of the Polymer 80, which were uh, all those guns I showed you before. They're the most popular uh, type of ghost gun handgun uh, for sale for illegal advertising and selling the untraceable firearms uh, uh, within the district. So again, not only banning them, they're taking action and suing uh, the manufacturer uh, of these uh, ghost guns. Again, moving forward and taking aggressive action. New York, uh, again, taking action, moving forward, uh, banning um, the these, these sale of online ghost guns and making sure that they're not getting into uh, the state of New York. And what has California done? Well, um, you know, we've done some things, but we don't think it's, it's enough. So for the 2020-2021 budget cycle, which is what we're in right now, that the governor's office uh, put in um, several additional million dollars to push for the implementation of ghost gun regulations and laws from July 2025 to July 2022. That was fantastic. However, uh, we were very disappointed that uh, with the Attorney General because he could have done this uh, on his own and with funding that he already had in place. However, would not move forward until he was given uh, what they consider proper funding in order to address this problem. Even though other states have taken a far more aggressive stance on it, you know, our Attorney General ha has not taken that aggressive stance. During that same time frame, in October of 2017, and I'm not joking here, um, California sued Gatorade because Gatorade said that it was, uh, it was better for you than water. Uh, I'll, I'll take a moment for that to sink in. And Gatorade settled with the state of California for $300,000. So while we can be suing Polymer 80 or some of these other ghost gun manufacturers, we decided here in California that it was more important to sue Gatorade. Yeah. All right, so what are we asking for? Uh, we believe that our, our Attorney General and our governor needs to take a leadership role in this and uh, push this issue at the top of their public safety impact. If you talk to law enforcement, especially people who deal with firearms, they're seeing a large influx of these crime guns uh, on the streets, and they're considered ghost guns, not regular firearms. And obviously, as all of you know, uh, I'm preaching to the choir here, that if they're not willing uh, to uh, step forward, then our California legislators must, and uh, we're the entity to help push that forward. So right now, Brady and other gun violence prevention groups uh, are, we're trying to address uh, this ever-growing problem with a number of different legislative ideas. Um, I really can't bring those forward right now, but in short order, we'll be uh, discussing that with our larger groups, and we're going to significantly need your support in pushing these forward. Now, I know there's a lot of other issues going, going out there. Uh, I'm also a high school teacher. Uh, on top of everything else. And I, I strongly believe in making sure that we notify parents about safe storage, but um, ghost guns, you know, it's a loophole. It, it's a roundabout from all of these laws. So it's one of the things that if we don't address them now, then the, probably the next 18 months, it'll become a problem that, that even here in California, we won't be able to dig our way out of. Thank you very much for the time. I, I know some of you have probably seen this presentation uh, a few dozen times, um, but it also it always solicits some uh, good information um, and also some uh, good comments about legislation that we can uh, move forward. And I know just talking uh, with Margo before uh, and uh, with her group, it solicited uh, some ideas for further uh, legislation, not only on the state level, but on the uh, city and county level that we're exploring at this time. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Steve, we have quite a few questions. The first question we received was, uh, 
Why don't gun sellers and gun manufacturers fight against ghost guns? They steal their market share from gun sellers and gun manufacturers. You'd think they wouldn't like that. What do you think? So that's actually an excellent question and also an excellent observation. So these ghost guns are uh, competing against uh, the manufacturers that are doing the right thing for the most part. I mean, uh, they, they have certain numbers that they're being able to track and they're uh, probably a little bit higher quality. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, that's just something that perplexes myself and a lot of other individuals. I've talked to friends at DOJ and ATF about that and everyone kind of scratched their head. What we're hopeful that doesn't happen is that these major manufacturers get in to the ghost gun business. Because if that happens, the quality of these are pretty high already, but they become, you know, the, the, the quality factors uh, go kind of through the roof. Plus these manufact other manufacturers like Glock, Beretta, and Six Hour have the capacity to push these out in volumes that I don't think we even can, can, can believe in. So, so far, I think the reason that they don't is they don't want any entanglements with ATF by being both in the uh, real gun uh, arena and in the ghost gun arena, but that could change at, at, at any moment. Thank you. Here's another interesting question. If a prohibited person is found with a ghost gun, are they criminally liable? If they just have it in the kit and it's not put together as a firearm, no, because under uh, right now under state and federal law, it's just hunks of steel and hunks of plastic. If it's put together as a firearm, yes. Then, you know, let's say the person was a convicted felon, then you can arrest them for a convicted felon in possession of a firearm. But it has to be put together and completed as a firearm before uh, we can uh, charge them with anything. Okay. And then someone asks, if the laws are only for California, that they're taking effect, let's say 2024, how do we stop ghost guns from traveling in from, let's say, Nevada or other states that don't have these kind of gun laws? Is this a federal priority? It seems rather large miss in our current laws. An honor system seems all wrong. Yes, so in, you know, one of the problems we've always had uh, is with uh, neighboring states not having as strict of firearm laws as we do, we've always had that influx of firearms, specifically from Nevada and from, from Arizona. That's not gonna change with the ghost gun uh, issue. So once again, either we need to get those states on the same page as California or address the problem at the federal level. ATF I can, is very aware uh, of this problem, not only in here in California, but across the nation. Uh, and as you see other states uh, get more restrictive laws, ghost guns will become a more popular uh, outlet for people uh, to purchase a firearm instead of going through the regular background check process. So again, it's, it, it is a predominantly a California issue right now, but what we've also seen is other states are seeing these issues and they're taking steps. Hopefully with the change of administration here in November, um, we can start addressing this ghost gun uh, issue on a federal level. Sounds great. Uh, Steve, I think there's people still have some other questions that they can, I think you covered a lot of their um, questions and, because it is complicated with the AG. Um, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep us moving, but Steve, uh, people can always reach out to you. What's your email address? Uh, my e email address is slindley, L-I-N-D-L-E-Y, at bradyunited.org. Thank you, Steve. That presentation is always you keep updating it, that Gatorade. I've seen your presentation, that just floored me and I think we'll all remember that. It's just, it's so upsetting. So thank you for always even updating your presentation. It's never dull and it's always, always alarming. So um, thank you. Thank you for the honor for presenting today. Thanks. Our next uh, panelist is Annalisa Dickman who works with Steve on the Crime Gun Initiative here in Milwaukee, I'm oh, sorry, in Milwaukee and also in the Midwest. And she's been with Brady since 2018. She has been a public policy professional for over 25 years. And after the Sandy Hook massacre, she left her job and went to work on reforming gun policy. And I want her to share her story why Annalisa left after the Sandy Hook massacre. And she's gonna share with us about the Boogaloo movement and I'm sure there's some other hot topics that we're getting close to the four o'clock hour, but um, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll try and answer them. Turn it over to you, Annalisa. Thanks so much, Suzanne. 
Yeah, after Sandy Hook, I decided I needed to use my skills to work on gun violence prevention. At the time, my daughter was in first grade. Her name is Aviel, and one of the victims in Sandy Hook was a first grader named Aviel, and that just seemed like a call from the universe for me to start doing something. So I'm so inspired by women like Margot and Donna who've been doing this for so long. And I thank them and Chica, of course. Um, I thank them for their work that they've been doing. Once I got into this, I discovered here in Wisconsin that most gun owners here, you know, they're hunters, maybe they have a handgun for protection at home, but we have a lot of common ground. We want um, we want our families to be safe, and we view gun rights as also a responsibility. But there's a small fraction of gun owners who have very extremist views around gun ownership and gun rights. And I started to really um, dig into who these people were, why they felt that way, and how, you know, how much damage could they possibly do. Um, and so we've heard a lot recently about the Boogaloo movement. Um, and so I'm gonna explain a little bit about that now. I want everyone to keep in mind though that Boogaloo is not an organization. It's not led by anyone. It's not a formal hierarchical system. It's more of, think of it more as a rallying cry. Um, it brings together a very um, strange variety of gun rights groups and anti-government groups and white supremacy groups, but they all have an affinity for guns and that's how they found each other. So this started in the early 2010s as a racist meme that was floating around online among these groups. Um, it comes from a movie from the 80s that was a sequel. Um, it was called Break Into Electric Boogaloo. And the sequel is really just the first movie with a different cast. And so they transformed that into a meme called Civil War to Electric Boogaloo. And it was really about inciting a second civil war. They really want to incite a race war they want to destabilize our government. They want to um, see society descend into chaos. They think if that happens, then they will come to power and they will rebuild the white supremacist state. Uh, so that's really troubling. <laughs> it sounds like a joke, Boogaloo, but it's actually a call to a violent insurgency. Um, and luckily now, uh, people like the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI are starting to understand more about it. Um, and as outsiders came to understand it more, the believers in it started, uh, and you know, how the internet works, started changing up the meme and changing up the symbolism. And then um, the reason they've been on our radar screen most recently is because as protests have become more common in the past four years. These um, people who really only knew each other through the internet decided to take action in real life and be out there for real. And so they started um, morphing this boogaloo word into words like big igloo or big luau. It sounds similar. It still sounds like a joke to most people but it provided them with symbols they could use to identify one another. So if you ever see photos of people armed to the teeth in camo and tactical gear and a Hawaiian shirt, that's someone who believes in this boogaloo rallying cry. They often have emblems like igloo emblems or they fly a flag that has an igloo where the field of stars should be. So those symbols are how they find one another uh, in real life, and they show up at these protests. Sometimes they show up to intimidate the protesters, and sometimes it's, it seems um, discordant, but sometimes they show up on behalf of the protesters. So we've seen some of them at Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter protests, supporting the protesters. 
And it's because they are fundamentally hoping to destabilize government. So they are anti-police, they're anti-military, they want to see civil warfare and civil conflict. So if they can show up at a protest and spark um, violence, that's to their own benefit and that's what they're hoping to have happen. So they are so dangerous for that reason. Of course, they always have their guns and they always use that violent rhetoric and um, they're starting to actually take action in real life. We've had a few incidents, including one in California this summer, where two law enforcement officers were shot by a Boogaloo believer with a ghost gun. So it's incredibly, incredibly troubling. Annalisa, thank you. Um, we have a question. What kind of legislation could we be advocating for to prevent these guys from accessing these guns or to keep them from brandishing these guns? I mean, that story in California is, it was horrific. So what can we be doing? Right, so in that story, it was a ghost gun. So all the things that Steve was just talking about and the legislation that Steve was talking about um, are important here too. Of course, things like background checks, all of the legislation we typically work toward but another thing to keep in mind is that for so many of them, this is a white supremacist belief or a neo-Nazi belief. And so in some cases, in some states, uh, hate crime misdemeanor does not prohibit you from owning a firearm. And so some states are looking at making hate crimes prohibitors um, that would allow people not to own firearms. And so that's one thing you could think about advocating for. Thank you. Uh, just curiously, Steve, we have a law, right, with the, the hate crime that you're not allowed to own, you, you have a prohibition? Yes, if you're convicted of certain hate crimes, there will be a uh, prohibition on the possession and sale, purchasing of a firearm. Okay. Um, we also have another question on Elisa. Is there any concern you have seen with the QAnon people and these Boogaloo people that they may end up in the same place or is it already <laughs> overlapping? That's a great question. There is definitely some overlap for sure. The conspiracy theories um, circle around the internet and hit all these groups. Um, anything that would cause people to be unhappy with their government is something the boogaloo would want to perpetrate so if QAnon is claiming that there are government actors who are doing nefarious deeds boogaloo would help perpetuate that conspiracy theory and try to use it to sow violence and discord thank you annalisa so much thank you for i'm so glad you came over to brady and i want to thank margo and donna and steve thank you so much and it's 354 so i'd like to turn it over to one of the original million mom marchers i call her the heart of brady our beloved chica hamilton and she wants to share a few remarks thank you thank you all um Especially thank you, Margo, Donna, Steve, and Annalisa, and Suzanne. I mean, you guys really moved that along, and thank you for the inf very important information. But before Suzanne closes out the day, please don't go yet because she has something really special to share. I would like to thank all the presenters that pre prepared and participated in our first ever virtual week-long Brady California Conference. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your personal stories. I also want to give a very special thanks to the volunteer planning committee that helped make every bit of this conference so meaningful and informative. Maddie Scott, Kat Sakalakis, Pelly Anderson, Kyle Anderson, Donna Finkelstein, Nicolette Rohr, and Suzanne Burge. They put their heart and soul into this conference and I think it clearly showed. I would also like to throw in a little kudos to my fall Brady interns, Larry, Lucas, Leah, and Melissa, who jumped in and did a phenomenal job in helping make this a successful event. They were personal lifesavers to me, so I, I have to give them that. And I would also like to give a huge thanks to our Brady communications team. Like I said, because this was our first 
ever virtual week long conference. There were a lot of moving, moving parts, videos, presenters from one session to the next and they handled it, all of it so professionally. So thank you. And finally, I would like to say thank you to the audience. We hope that you found this conference informative and inspiring. Thank you for working with us to end gun violence. And together, we really, truly can make a difference. Thank you. Suzanne, kicking it back to you. Thanks, Sheikha. I am so grateful to my Brady family. And I know all of us are, um, we're a family. We've been together a long time. And I'm so grateful to this Brady family. And I know I speak on behalf of everyone. It's an amazing group of people. And um, we've been through a lot. But that makes our friendship and our love that much stronger. And as we said, you know, at the beginning, today is the National Day of Remembrance for murder victims. And it's just a short video. And it's a reminder for why we do the work we do, for those people whose voices have been taken from us because of a gun. And we want to remember them. And um, we, we're going to work hard, especially towards November. And let's get it done. But let's remember the people we've lost along the way. I'm Lucy Brito. I Our comms team is exhausted too. <laughs> That's it, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.